Bullet to the Veteran Podcast. Thank you for your service. All right, everybody, welcome back to Bulletproof Veteran Podcast. This is one that I'm excited about, all right? We talk here at Bulletproof Veteran Podcast all about being a better veteran and maximizing that post-military life. And really, you know, everything that we do, every interview that we do, every event that we do, every run, everything we promote is around that idea of living our best lives after our military service is complete. Um, And I have a guest on the show today that basically he took his post-military life and that is his goal to help us do that. Um, It's, it's kind of amazing. His story is great. So I think you're really going to enjoy just hearing kind of how he came up through the ranks, becoming, you know, special forces and then a medic and then a doctor. I mean, kind of, did everything. So uh, we have Dr. Mike Simpson on the show. He is the author of Honed, Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40. And we're going to talk about why that's so important. But Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me on. Great to be here. Well, like we like to do on the show, uh, I like to hear about the person before we kind of get into the topics. This way we know where you're coming from. And you have quite a history. So we'll (laughs) we'll dive right into that. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I, yeah, I got some city miles on me for yeah, sure. You do. Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I guess I'll go all the way back. Uh, I'll, I'll, I usually do this in reverse order, but I'll, I'll do it in, in sequential order this time. So uh, born and raised uh, Southern California. Don't hold that against me. Yeah, um, I'm a New Yorker, l- trust me. I, I did yeah, left, <laughs> <laughs> left the South Bay area, that, which uh, people that are not from California, but area um it when i was about uh, 10 11 years old moved to a very rural part of california in the uh, the inland portion of california we were actually called by other people in california hillbillies if you can believe there is such a thing in southern california i live in a small town called tehachapi that's where i spent my formative years that's where i graduated high school very very small town uh working class upbringing uh two weeks out of high school i i where i actually so between Junior and senior year, I signed up on delayed entry, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners probably did. Mm-hmm. Shipped off, uh, shipped off two weeks out of, after high school graduation, on an unassigned Ranger contract, infantry. Uh, went to basic training at Airborne School of Fort Benning, then went to Hunter Army Airfield, Savannah, Georgia, where I went through the Ranger indoctrination program, as it was called at the time. Um, I was assigned to a weapons platoon in Alpha Company, First Ranger Battalion. I did four years there as in a 90 millimeter recordless rifle section. Got up to E5 uh, as, as AT section leader. Got out, uh, went into the National Guard, the Special Forces National Guard, 20th group out of Florida. Uh, originally, my plan was either to go be a weapons guy or go be a demo guy. I hadn't really decided yet. Probably a weapons guy. And was in that unit for a few years and uh, as what they call an NQP, a non-qualified person, um, because I wasn't qualified in my TONE, MTONE, MOS, which was 18 series. Then uh, when we got mobilized for Desert Storm, Desert Shield, mobilized but did not deploy, so we went to Fort Bragg. That's when I went through Special Forces Selection, went through the Q course, went through language school, decided I really missed being on active duty and I wanted to uh, come back, so I did. Signed out of 20th group, signed into 7th group as an 18 Charlie Special Forces engineer. Did that for a few years, wanted a little bit more of a mental challenge. And uh, if a, there were a lot of factors at play that kind of led me into being an SF medic, you know, wanting it, wanting the challenge, wanting, uh, wanting to be the MOS that basically was always doing their real world job literally all the time. Uh, and also, I wanted an excuse to get get the hell out of Fayetteville for a while, and that was back when the course was at Fort Sam. So uh, went to the course for all the wrong or right reasons, depending on how you slice it. Found out that medicine was a little bit of a calling for me. I knew at that point that my future lie in medicine, and uh, I had, had an eye on a timetable because I knew at some point I would get promoted off of a team, uh, or I would get promoted to team sergeant, and then it wasn't. Uh, long after I became E7 that I actually deployed in a team sergeant position and didn't like it, didn't like being a team sergeant. I want, I, I, I missed doing the medical aspect of it. So I uh, did my undergrad 
and finished my undergrad while I was in active duty going to night school, um, you, you know, using tuition assistance, which had such an underutilized and probably under school paid for yeah, right it's there. Amazing. Well, and if you're stationed in North Carolina, in addition to that, the state of North Carolina is very good to veterans. You mm -hmm. know, we talk about how they overtax us and everything else, but they give you what's what they call the North Carolina land grant, which is an additional pile of money going towards books and tuition. So like literally I would sign up for a full ride, uh, a full semester and get all of my books and everything. And I'd be there at the counter at the education center, the Campbell University office on, on Fort Bragg. And they would say, okay, all right, everything combined, we're gonna need $12 from you. <laughs> so I would pay $12 when all was said and done for a semester uh, of college. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was great. And I, I recognize it, it's hard because not a lot of people in active duty have time to do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the command is a little bit less than, than open to letting you do that. I was kind of fortunate in, I had a reputation as a work workhorse. I worked my, my ass off in the same battalion and seventh group the whole time. So when the time came for me during support cycle to knock out some college and then ultimately go to the, uh, the company headquarters, go to what they call the B team, um, and spend some time uh, going to school, as long as it didn't interfere with my duties during the day, everybody was fine with it and finished my undergraduate, took my MCAT, uh, applied to medical school, was actually in the med school application process when 9-11 went down, almost pulled all my applications, had a, a very wise Sergeant Major talk me out of that, and uh, went to medical school at the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. So I got paid to go to medical school. I had to wear class Bs for three days a week and, and BDUs for two days a week. Uh, no big deal. I was used to wearing a uniform anyway. Yeah. So I got I got second lieutenant pay to be a medical student. Graduated uh, residency at uh, in San Antonio, Texas, and finished my in residency and got my dream job, which was uh, to be assigned to the Joint Medical Augmentation Unit out of uh, JSOC uh, at Fort Bragg. So I did six years providing direct medical support to all the the tier one units doing all the high speed stuff and uh, uh, six years and five deployments, very rewarding. And then ultimately I retired out of Fort Hood uh, as, the, as the chair of emergency medicine at Darnell. And that was in 2016. And now I'm here in central Texas with my family. I'm a SWAT physician. Um, as you mentioned, I, I, I wrote a book and I have a, a supplement and life, life and lifestyle company on the side, but I, I really owe Aside from the fact that I, I tell uh, and I it, literally immediately before walking up the stairs to, to sit down and record with you, I was reiterating to my wife how much I owe to her and, and, and how much she has made me the man that I am uh, in so many different ways. But, you know, it, I, I credit obviously my parents had something to do with it. But, you know, the alliance share I, of the credit I give to my wife and to the United States Army for making me the person that I am. Yeah. I say it all the time and I, I get some grief from some of my buddies. Like you're, you're always talking about your wife and I'm like, that's because if she didn't kick my ass on a regular basis, right. It probably would be the biggest piece of shit known to man. Um, she keeps me grounded. She keeps me centered in what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, manages my ADD and keeps me on task when I need it. Um, mm -hmm. but also, reminds me sometimes of how lucky I am to have had the, the path that I kind of took. You know, you talked about student loans and stuff like that. I don't have any. I went all the way up through my master's. I don't have one student loan to pay a awesome. dime for anything. My wife has her master's mental health counseling, had to work at Costco the entire time she was going to mm. school all the way through and right. still is paying right now, right. every month, paying the government for her student loans. And we talk about it quite often. And she's like, man, it was such a gift that you were given because I'm still mm -hmm. paying. I think so many veterans look that gift horse in the mouth sometimes and don't 100%, take advantage of it. 100%. Brutal, yeah. yeah. You know. But between, uh, you know, I, I was in a bit of an interesting situation because as I said, I went in, the, in 1984. That was back when we had what was called VEEP, mm -hmm. Veterans Educational Assistance Program, I think is what it stood for. And I didn't, I didn't max it out. I, I paid into it really more than anything to kind of please my parents because I promised them uh, when they they had to sign for me to go into on delayed entry when I was 17. So 
that was the agreement that I made with them that I would take advantage of the college fund. Cause of course that's the big selling point of course. Uh, that the, the army was, that's the drum they were banging back then and probably still are. Um, I, I didn't really care about that. And I, da I dabbled in a little bit of college when I got out, I got some of my, my first year prereqs out of the way. Uh, I wasn't a really good student. I didn't really apply myself. Um, I ended up when I came back on active duty, cashing in the rest of my VEEP. And then it was, it was a big surprise to me, actually, because I was already a physician. Again, I was the chief of emergency medicine, and I had to go to a mandatory briefing on the post 9-11 GI Bill. And I was pissed because it was like at 530 in the morning because they schedule it really early. So it went under for clinical shifts. So I'm, I'm mad because I didn't, I didn't want to. So I walk in and I go, hey, where do, where do I sign? Look, I, I had Veep. I know I don't, I don't get this. I just need to sign and get out of here. Like, I'm not going to listen to the briefing. And the very patient E7, who I'm sure is used to babysitting officers all the time, says to him, <laughs> well, sir, hold on a second. Maybe you do. Have. He's let me look. And he looked it up and he's like, not only do you have the post 9-11 GI Bill, but you've got it in total. You've got it complete. You got the full meal deal, mm -hmm. you know, and he goes, you know, you can transfer that to your wife or to your kids. And I'm like, oh, OK, now you have my full and undivided attention. I don't care so, that it's 5.30, pour another pot of coffee right, yeah, and let's yeah. get to work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now I'm like, okay, now my, my ass is in the seat, right? So, and, and my oldest is going to Texas A&M uh, pursuing an architecture degree right now on that post 9-11 GI Bill. And because we're here in Texas, my youngest will, will get the Hazelwood Act and he'll go to a Texas school on the Hazelwood Act. So I, I got to say, I mean, when it comes to higher education, I did tuition. I mean, I used Veep. To, again, to kind of dabble for a year, mm -hmm. but then I used tuitions assistance to knock out three years of school. I got medical school paid for, so I have no loans for that. My my oldest is going to get a degree because of my service. My youngest is going to get a degree because of my service. So that's definitely, uh, I'm definitely not part of that group. Look, gift horse in the mouth, but I agree that so many do, and it's such a shame. And I mean, we're not just talking regular vanilla college either. We're talking, you know, Votech schools, you know, you want to go to welding school, yep. truck driving school, culinary school, flight you, school, flight school. It's, it's all available to you, you know, yep. and uh, these, these are pathways to licensure for very lucrative jobs right out the door, you know? Uh, so if, man, if people aren't taking advantage of it and you know what the problem is though, is some of us, when we get, especially when we get towards the end of our enlistment, people are tired tired of tired of the green weenie right and they're mm -hmm. they're tired of of sitting through all these mandatory briefings all this bullshit. and it's like i just want to get out of here so they're like yeah, yeah yeah they're whatever in these briefings and they're signing it like like i was doing you know i know people who missed out on va benefits because of that who missed out on educational benefits because of that when all it would have taken was their attention for a 45 minute period and that's that's really sad but unfortunately the the military a lot of times you know it's it's deserved that it that it sours you to these man all these mandatory briefings that are just somebody up there droning on and on and on about something you're never going to need to know so if anybody's listening to this and you're you know you're a year out from ets man, pay attention in all of those meetings you sit down on, take advantage of, sign up for the extra ones, the extra one-on-ones where you talk to individual counselors about, about things like how to write your resume and your education benefits and your VA benefits. Man, don't, don't neglect that. Yeah, I was guilty of it. Uh, I'll be completely honest, and I've talked about it on the show before. I was a know-it-all 20... Uh, what was I, 25? Weren't, weren't we all, though? Uh, right? yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, and I was like... I know exactly what I want to do when I get out. I don't have to go to any of these briefings. I don't mm -hmm. have to do any of this crap. I was in Italy. I wanted to enjoy the last like six months of my active duty, travel around Italy. I'd saved up 30 days of leave. I took nice. that like, you mm -hmm. know, I, I did everything that I wanted to do in my head. I knew what I was going to do when I got home. Mm -hmm. Man, was I wrong. Every plan <laughs> that I laid out just crashed and burned. Yeah. And I found myself in that situation where I was like, man, I really probably should have paid attention because I would have got better educational benefits. I would have gotten BAH when I first got out because I would have done the post 9-11 right away. Mm -hmm. um, I would have set myself up better to talk to the VA about disability benefits. I would have went to more doctors before I got out. All mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. I'm fighting right now. And I know you've talked about it uh, previously about setting yourself up for your VA benefits and being able to document that knee injury or that back injury or, you know, 
whatever weird condition you may have, especially lung stuff with burn pits and all this other mm-hmm. stuff, if you don't document that stuff, yeah. you have an uphill battle coming your way. Yeah. And too many of us just went, ah, it's all good. I'll figure it out. Well, I, I'll tell you what I did is uh, I, I not only I kicked that can down the road, but I swept it under the carpet for so long. You know, it's, uh, you know, if it's almost like I was hiding something on a health and welfare inspection, I didn't want anybody to know about my knees, my -hmm. feet, my back, my shoulder, because I wanted to keep jumping out of airplanes. I wanted to keep deploying overseas. Uh, I wanted to keep doing those, those things. I didn't want to take valuable time out of my schedule to go to appointments and get stuff. And, and you hear all the horror stories too. Oh, they did a send me to physical therapy and it didn't do anything. So, and I was one of those guys, I, I, I kept it all a secret and I, I didn't go on sick call. Mm-hmm. And finally, on the advice of, of another physician who retired about a year ahead of me, um, about, a, about, a, about a year, year and a half out, um, I, I had to ask somebody, where do I even go? Like, I don't know who, I'm a physician working in a hospital. I don't even know who my primary care physician is. Somebody had to tell me, you know, I'm the chief of my department. One of my people had to tell me, oh, we're assigned to the family medicine clinic down the hall. So I walked down there and I'm like, I need an appointment. Who's your PCM? I don't know. So they had to look it up and tell me. And they're like, what do you need to be seen for? And I, I said, well, I guess I'll start at the top and work my way down. Mm-hmm. Headaches? <laughs> yeah. and, and they gave me an appointment. And the night before I sat down at my computer and I typed up. And again, I went from head to toe. I typed up everything that was wrong with me. Every time I'd knock my head on a jump, every time, uh, you know, something had hurt after, after a road march or a fall, everything, I typed it all up and it ended up being about three pages, three typewritten pages of stuff. And, uh, I went into the appointment and, uh, a really cool, uh, PA came out and she said, uh, she said, I went to open up, you know, Alta and take a look so I could, you know, we, we do this, they do this thing called copy forward for your medical history. And then they just add to it. So she said, I went to copy forward. There's nothing to copy forward. She said, you haven't seen anyone. As far as I can tell, she goes, I'm, I'm guessing you had to at some point, but I'm guessing that was back when we did paper charting. I'm like, yeah. And she said, okay, so what brings you in today? I said, yeah, about that. And I pulled these papers out of my pocket. I said, here you go. And she said, all right. And again, this is, you know, this is soldiers helping soldiers. She's like, all right, we're going to get all this taken care of. And so she, she wrote an extensive note and an extensive plan on how we were going to uh, uh, run down each and every one of these maladies. So they would be in my medical record. Yeah. And that's basically, I spent the last year of my career going to multiple appointments getting uh, jolts of electricity passed through the nerves in my arms and sitting in the MRI donut uh, and everything else doing sleep studies so I could get all this documented. So, you know, it, if, again, if somebody's, if, if you're coming up on getting out uh, and you've been doing that, write everything down that's really wrong with you and go on, go on sick call or make an appointment and go in there and go, look, this is all the shit that I've been hiding because that's what sh- soldiers do. Just, as long as there's a note on it, as long as there's a note in your record that says somewhere, SM says uh, lower back pain ever since the uh, EIB road march two years ago. Yep. As long as that note is in there, it doesn't matter if there's not enough time for you to get the MRIs and everything else. Now you can you can take care of that when you when you get out and continue the process. Um, but as long as there is just a note, a blurb somewhere that says it. Yeah, that's going to help you immensely. Yeah. But I think all of this is kind of an analog for men in general. And <laughs> yes. I, have a, I have a lot of female listeners and I don't want to dis, you know, you know, disassociate from them or exclude them from the talk, but your book is, you know, yeah. geared towards men over the age of 40. And yeah. I think exactly what you're talking about that military. So we press it, press it, press it. Don't take care mm-hmm. of anything. And then right at the last minute, all right, let's try to take care of it. That is the exact same thing that I think every man does, or at least yeah. the majority of us. We press it all the way, and then all of a sudden we turn around, we're 45, we're 50, and now it's like, man, I mm-hmm. don't have a primary care physician. I haven't been to the dentist in ages. Um, my back's been killing me. Don't take a look at that. Uh, I 
I don't take care of my diet or anything. Haven't had my cholesterol checked, my testosterone checked. Uh, you know, I don't even know what my blood pressure is. Mm -hmm. And you turn around and when you finally go to sit down with a doctor, it's the same thing. You have to make a list head to toe of even things you want to look at. Yeah. Um, so kind of using that to get into really what we we're going to talk about today, the book. So yeah. that is kind of what you tried to do here. And I love the way you structured it. You have little takeaways at the end of each chapter. So for people that maybe, you know, reading comprehension isn't their strong point and they kind of forget things you can kind of swing to the back of each chapter and take a look and see your bullet statements of what was covered in that chapter and then go back, kind of highlight what you want to know and everything. But really it walks us through how to live that best life after 40 and kind of undo the 40 years of being a man right. and being stupid basically. Yeah, no, exactly. And the, and the way that I verbalize it in the book, of course, is, you know, I talk about performance optimization versus longevity optimization. And, and we, we spend as soldiers, especially we're all about performance optimization. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a, there is some type of, uh, you know, we're going to, um, GRTC, we're going to, you know, we're going to NTC. We have some type of event coming up. We have the EIB coming up, the EFMB coming up. We've got a PT test coming up. We've got a deployment coming up. There's something coming up. So we are redoubling our efforts to be prepared for that. Right. Uh, and that's, that is, um, performance optimization that I'm, I want to peak my performance right when this event is coming up. But because we are doing that in a cyclical fashion and often taking shortcuts, and as I say in my book, shortcuts pave the way to injuries or the path to injuries is paved, or the, the path to injuries is paved with shortcuts, I think is the way that I said it. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a recipe for disaster and, it, and it's, it's going to cause injuries. And I talk about specific injuries that I got during times like that in the military, because I was go, go, go mission first. I'm sacrificing my body at the altar of mission readiness. And now years later, I'm paying the price. So, you know, to somebody saying, if, if you're under 40 and you haven't turned this off yet, I would say, you know, learn the lessons that I learned the hard way and, uh, and incorporate them into the way you do business now. And then you won't have those issues. Cause if, if you look at longevity optimization as a priority, not saying you're not going to look at performance optimization, but you're going to prioritize longevity. Um, you can have both. If you always pri prioritize performance, you will have performance to a point and then it will, and then you're going to hit a wall. Yeah. Um, you know, so longevity is the key and that's what I encourage everybody to do. Keep doing that really quick too. So you talked about, you know, you're the ladies in your audience mm -hmm. and yeah, my book, I, I had to write about, I know what it's like to be a 40 year old man. I don't know what it's like to be a 40 year old woman, but what I do know about female soldiers is because female soldiers um let, let, let's be honest here they're, they're under a little bit more scrutiny than male soldiers tend to be so they will skip sick call mm -hmm. they will hide injuries because of the judgment because of the judgment that comes from their male peers and oh there she there she is again she's you know she's yeah you know female bone structure female you know here's, here's all the muttering right mm -hmm. oh yeah you know females don't have the bone density females don't have the muscle mass that we have of course she's hurt right it's you know females aren't cut out for this so they're going to hide those injuries they're going to avoid sick call when a lot of times they probably need to go and they're going to pay the price later a prime example of that um and i her name escapes me there was a, a female mp captain back during uh operation just cause okay and uh it's it's we could do a whole podcast just on her story it's I, i'm not i'm not particularly a fan of hers for a lot of reasons but <laughs> but the way her story ends is very emblematic of this because she 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 was actually championed this is before they even had any conception at all about uh, letting allowing women into combat arms and she was kind of a case study that they were pointing to as uh, this is why we should let women in combat arms her story ended up being bs but that's again that's a whole nother podcast mm -hmm. But years later, she came out and said, you know what, I, I tried to do that. I tried to, I tried to do everything. And, and, and at the same time, recognizing that I had the additional burden of not only being a woman, but being an officer. So always having to set the example. So I couldn't go on sick call. I couldn't say when I was hurt and she ended up having a, just a myriad of health problems later because of that. 
because again, she was, she was stashing stuff under the rug incrementally and constantly of hmm, maybe I should get this looked at. Nope. I'm going to be judged. So I'm not going to get it looked at. And she, she came out and talked about it later that, you know, I'm, I'm a complete wreck physically now because of that. And, and of course, and again, this was the eighties when we didn't know, we didn't know, and we trained in really stupid ways that would, would wreck anybody male or female. Uh, but again, you know, she, she, she kind of doubled down. She was, she was trying to be more macho than the guys were. And ultimately it, it ended up costing her in the, in the terms of a lot of orthopedic injuries. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And it's so funny to me. And like, I was thinking about it earlier today, you know, you talk about longevity and you talk about all those things. And, and, you know, here's an example of a woman sweeping things under the rug. There's a thousand example of men sweeping things under the rug and not yeah. talking about it. And like you said, that difference between performance and longevity and you used, uh, you know, uh, exercises and things like that as examples that we do that in the military all the time where we, we have this event and we want to be the best that we can be for the event. Mm -hmm. And what do enlisted guys do all the time in the lead up to that? We complain. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we like this all the time? Right. It's guaranteed right. <laughs> that almost every enlisted guy says yeah. that during that lead up. Why don't we do this all the time? Why are we only doing it for an exercise? We're only getting ready. Right. But then we turn around and we do it in our lives. We only right. take care of ourselves when we have to. We right. don't do it the whole time. We don't train the way we're supposed to the whole time. It's just yeah. for these singular events. So we're guilty of it, even though we know it's wrong. Yeah, it's hundred percent. And that's, tough. and we're, we're guilty of a lot of other stuff too, is, is, you know, they don't, they don't come down at army level. They don't come down as individuals and micromanage our nutrition. You know, we, mm -hmm. the, you go to the chow hall, you go to the defac and what's there is what's there. Right. Nobody's telling you if you want to eat a, eat a cheeseburger every day, no one is going to stop you. You know, if, if you want to eat, if you want to go through the breakfast line and eat French toast, day, no one is going to stop you. Right. Mm -hmm. So there, there is some personal, you know, they're, they're giving you the means, but there is some personal responsibility there as well. Um, you know, in the, in the high, higher tier units, you do have, you got a nutritionist weighing in on, you know, you, you are getting individual counseling on stuff like that. It's probably cost prohibitive to do that army wide, to be honest. Um, but there's, there's nothing preventing people from doing it themselves. There's also nothing preventing you, excuse me. There's nothing preventing you from using some of your free time to do some things that are going to better your health outside of whatever weird PT program your chain of command right might have. I guarantee you on almost any post, uh, you can, you can probably go to the rec center or the fitness center at night and there's going to be yoga classes there. Yeah. So, so it's going to be you and a bunch of sergeants, majors, wives. So what, I mean, you know, do, you know, yoga is good for you. Go do yeah. yoga. Uh, you know, there's nothing preventing you on, on a weekend from, from going out and doing something, you know, I, I paid, I paid for my own jujitsu on active duty. You know, there was a time you know, when, when I was stationed at Bragg, I got it for free. When I was here at Fort Hood, I didn't get it for free. So I had to go out on the economy and pay for my own jujitsu. And uh, a lot of places are going to give you, a, you know, you go in and say, Hey, look, I'm a, I'm an E3 at this base over here. Well, they'll cut you some type of deal. And now that, you know, uh, you know, veterans jujitsu is spreading all over the country too, yes. where vets are getting together and rolling and mm -hmm. uh and helping each other out and you know you can get you can get discounts you can get it for free in some cases um so you know take take advantage of that don't it's don't put it all the whole blame isn't all on uncle sugar because let's be honest you signed a contract to give them something and as long as you're giving that to them they're happy and is it is it true that they'll chew you up and spit you out and they don't this this faceless embodiment we call the military it doesn't really care about you as an individual mm -hmm. so you need to care about yourself yeah. um you know it's it, it that's part of that's on you so it's you know I, again could we treat our people better absolutely we could um but part of that's on you too man so you know i mean be an adult about understanding how the relationship works yeah. you are a come you are a commodity i knew when i was a private I was a commodity, right? I might get told to charge a machine gun nest because I was expendable. I recognize that. We should all recognize that. Um, don't be resentful for that. Recognize it and understand how you can adapt 
uh, yourself to address, you know, what, what they're, you know, it, it, it's a relationship like anything. And, and uh, you, know, you need to address how you give and take in the relationship as well. Yeah. And I think that being an adult, uh, go, that's a big statement um, because it's, it's exactly what you need to do when you are a veteran as well. Mm -hmm. You need to eat like an adult. And, I, and I, when I say eat like an adult, make adult decisions for your food. Don't eat like the average American adult because that's eating right. like a child. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like you say in the book, if it comes from a box, a bag, or mm -hmm. in the freezer aisle, it's yeah. probably not a good thing to put in your body. Now, yeah. are there levels of balance? Of course, you know, yes. you want to have a slice of pizza. It, should you never have that? I think you talk about exclusionary diets um, mm -hmm. in your book as well and how they're, 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 they can be traps if they're mm -hmm. used incorrectly. Um, totally. You know, uh, if you have medical issues that exclude a certain item because it's dangerous for you, that's one thing. But if you're just cutting things out, the, the chance of success always decline because you're not going to sustain it. Um, if you don't have good reasoning and good kind of... Um, a good mantra behind it. Um, mm -hmm. You talk about being an adult when it comes to exercise. And again, that's not like your average American adult. That's just the idea that you're going to be disciplined. You're going to mm -hmm. do it three or four times a week. You're going to look at some feedback of, is your exercise actually working? Are you just going out and doing deadlifts? And I think you say it, uh, don't skip leg day. Um, <laughs> You know, are you only doing your glamour muscles and not doing any cardio? You mm -hmm. know, it's great to have good looking biceps and take your shirt off at the pool. But if you get winded when you walk up the stairs, are you really physically fit? Um, can you talk a little bit about your overall philosophy of nutrition and, uh, um, you know, exercise that you think works for someone over the age of 40, a man over the age of 40? Absolutely. And, you know, nutrition wise, you pretty much nailed it already. It's, you know, if it's in a bag, if it's in a box, if it's in a can, if it comes from the freezer, if it's handed to me through my car window, not nature intended me to be eating mm -hmm. as close as you can get to source, right? You know, the, if, if I kill the chicken, that's the best case scenario. If I, if I kill it, dress it, pluck it, and it goes in the, in the pan or in the oven, that's ideal. Um, you know, a after that is, you know, just, you know, getting good, wholesome, you know, non, uh, non antibiotic organic, you know, chicken breasts, and, and it goes down the line from there. But, you know, once I'm getting it in a, in a, in again, in a bucket handed to me through my car window, now we probably degraded the nutritional value and it's probably too much sodium and probably too much fat, too much cholesterol and additives and preservatives and hormones and antibiotics and everything else in that. So, but it's all, it's all about moderation. You know, a balanced diet is, is pretty, it's pretty easy to figure out what that mm -hmm. is. And, and I do give a, a pretty specific formula in how to break down your protein, how to break down your fat and your carbohydrates. And though that's a guideline, it's a starting point. It's not, it's not set in stone. Uh, you know, your, your level of activity is, and, and what you want out of your nutrition is going to dictate that as well. Um, we as Americans have a really unhealthy relationship with food and, you know, you have to look at food as a fuel source. You know, every meal doesn't have to be just absolutely the most delicious thing you've ever had. Um, it, it just doesn't have to be that way. You know, if, if it had to be that way, you know, I'd have a lot of ribeye steaks and, and a lot of enchiladas and tacos and bacon cheeseburgers and pizza. But, you know, you have to look at it as fuel. So, again, in the Western world, our, our relationship with food just, just absolutely sucks. Mm -hmm. Exclusionary diet. So that's, you know, that's the lure of, oh, the carnivore diet. Oh, the vegan diet. Oh, the this, the that, the, you know, uh, eliminating carbs, you know, and, and I've tried some of these. But the problem with that is it's not millions of years of evolution say that's not how we were designed. Um, it's not sustainable over the long term, and it's probably not good for you over the long term, right? It's, you know, you need a healthy balance of everything, protein, fat, carbohydrates, micronutrients, you know, to include all your vitamins, your trace minerals. You need all of that. Um, and a lot, and most Americans just, just aren't getting it. So, and that's yeah. where supplementation kind of comes into play. When it comes to fit, fitness, 
you, you have to have a well-rounded fitness routine. And that, that doesn't mean only doing the stuff that you enjoy. I tried that for a while. Uh, I tried that uh, towards the end of my military career. And in the first part of retirement, I said, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to work out anymore. I'm only going to, I'm going to, if I'm either on the mat grappling or I'm in there, I'm in there with gloves on hitting the bag or sparring. Like everything I do is just, I'm going to, I'm just going to go in and fight. And that's like all I'm going to do. I was injured constantly because hmm. I was neglecting all the stabilization muscles. I was neglecting my mobility. I was neglecting my flexibility. Um, and I, I was just hurt all the time. I gained a bunch of weight and, and I realized, you know, what? I, I do, I need a comprehensive, well-rounded program that addresses all of the aspects of fitness. You know, my, my cardio, my strength, my power, my mobility, my flexibility, my durability, all of these things. So you need to have a well-rounded program and that's, that's tricky. And I, I, I really do advise people to get out of their bubble and sit down with, sit down with a fitness coach and that, and, but you have to be careful because there's, if, if I go walk into the, the local, we don't have a gold gym uh, here near me, but we've got, we've got a competitor that's very, very similar. And if I walk in there right now, uh, there's two or three meatheads right at the front of the gym, okay, that uh, are more than happy to sign up to, to be coaches for people. Well, the problem with that is those guys, like you say, they're all their show muscles look awesome. Yep. Okay. Um, their cardio probably sucks. Their durability probably sucks. Um, at least a portion of, of what you're seeing when you look at them came out of a syringe, not out of a proper, uh, a proper program. And I'm not knocking anybody, you know, that's people knock on, on testosterone. They knock on steroid stuff. Guess what? You still got to put the work in. You know, it's not like you can't sit on the couch playing video games and pumping, pumping uh, horse drugs into your thigh and, and look like Arnold. You just, that's just not going to happen. Um, so those guys are still putting in the work. Don't get me wrong. But comp functional fitness has gotten a bad rap over the last few years. Anti CrossFitters have, have, have kind of condemned that term, but functional fitness really is a good thing, but it, it also means different things to different people. Functional fitness for me is, um, when I go to jujitsu and I do a two hour class. And then at the end of that two hour class, I do, uh, you know, four rounds of five to six minutes of, of full on sparring with guys that are younger than me. And oftentimes are bigger than me. Um, how do I perform and how do I feel? Do I have to be peeled off the mat by someone or can I walk out to my vehicle under my own power with a smile on my face? Um, so that's how I gauge my fitness. And that's, mm -hmm. to me, that's what functional fitness is all about. It's also for me about, because I'm a SWAT doc about being able to put on body armor and climb over obstacles and through windows and get in and out of vehicles and, and, and sprint up to target and, and stack on the door without injuring myself and, and being completely incapacitated for when, so when that door opens, if I have to engage a target, I'm completely out of commission. Um, so again, it's, it, it might mean different things to different people, but, you know, do something that provides you a well-rounded fitness program. Don't just stick to what you love. Don't just stick to what's easy, um, because you're going to be neglecting somewhere else. And the, the, the example I give in the book is, you know, I talk about, you get the old man strength guys that you go in the gym, they got their, they're, they're built kind of like I'm built, right? I'm built like a whiskey keg. Usually they got a little bit bigger gut. They'll have a, each knee will be wrapped. Each elbow will be wrapped. They got the old school lifting belt on <laughs> yeah. that you can tell they've had for a really long time. It's probably it's, on its last it's notch. It's still leather. Like it's there's still no padding. Leather. Yes. Yeah. And cracked. I got one of those somewhere. I got to dig it out. <laughs> <laughs> so they're wearing that. And, and what are they doing? They're doing, they're doing bench press. They're doing military press. They're mm -hmm. doing deadlift. They're doing squats. Maybe they're adding some flies or something else, but that's pretty much it. Right. And they're just, they're going for PRs, right? They're doing, they're doing low reps. Uh, high intensity, you know, heavyweights. And these guys are happy doing that. These guys are going to, are going to, by the time they're my age, these guys are going to have their first heart attack in a lot of cases. Then the other guys, those guys you see, not an ounce of body fat on them. They got a nice suntan all the time because they're running five to 10 miles every day and they're running 20 on the weekends. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Those guys are great cardio. They're, if, if I do a coronary artery study on them, pristine, absolutely pristine. Okay. If I put them in, if I knock one of them on their ass, 
and and throw a 120 pound female purple belt on top of them, they're going to get wrecked. Wrecked. Absolutely wrecked. Yeah. They don't have the strength. They don't have the flexibility. They don't have uh, the adaptability uh, to get out of that situation. You know, if they had to fight their way out of a burning building or out of a, uh, you know, they were entrapped in a car, they're going to die in place. You know, they definitely couldn't carry somebody out of that building because their cardio is great. You know, they're biking or they're running or whatever it is, but they don't have the strength. So, you know, be well-rounded and, yeah. you know, it's uh, people bag on CrossFit. I don't do CrossFit. You know, I get where I go to uh, OPEX Round Rock is my home gym. It looks like a CrossFit box, but it's really not. It's a lot more, it's a lot more customized. It's a lot more individual, but um, I don't think CrossFit is a bad thing. There's some reasons why I don't do it. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot, I think the good that CrossFit does outweighs the bad and, you know, pe people disagree with me. Um, but I tell people find something that's kind of quasi CrossFit, you know, yeah. or if you want to do CrossFit, that's great. You know, if you don't find something that's kind of quasi CrossFit, you yeah, know, do some exercises. exercises. Yeah. 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 Do some exercises. You wouldn't normally, you know, get, make friends with a kettlebell, man, just discover yeah. all the great things you can get out of kettlebells you know, discover all the great things that you can get out of, you know, things like battle ropes mm -hmm. and the, and these other things that normally maybe you would not have tried pushing a sled, yeah. you know, doing, pulling a, pushing a sled, pulling a sled. You don't you have know, to go uh, marry, marry a tire from a tractor. Like it's, it's okay. Right. You can leave that part out, but yeah, get involved in what the benefits can be. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. And that's, you know, and if you look at that, you know, you look at tire flipping and we don't even have a tire at my gym. Right. But I, I've flipped tires before. Mm -hmm. And if you look at tire flipping, that's a really good exercise that engages your entire connect chain. Yep. Um, it's, it's a power workout. It's an endurance workout. Um, it, it, it's a, it's a great thing to do. And that's, you know, that's something, neither of those two guys that I described, neither the old man strength guy or, or the ultra marathoner would be very good at that. Right. Right. Cause the old man strength guy, he'd, he'd flip that tire the first time. Like, yeah, yeah. Check that shit out. Number Darn. two, number two, a uh, little bit slower. Mm -hmm. Number three, now he's about to cough up a lung, you know, ultra marathoner would go up there and, <laughs> and it's not budging. Right. Yep. So they're both extreme ends of the spectrum and, and you want to be kind of in the middle of that spectrum Yeah. for longevity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always, uh, I, and again, not to talk about my wife again, but uh, she does um, bar exercises and power mm -hmm. yoga. And you want to talk about being humbled. I yeah. tried power yoga one time yeah i felt like i was gonna die i did her bar exercise one time i felt like i was gonna die right and i run i exercise or at least at, and at that time i was doing you know quite a bit but it was just muscles that i had never used before so when you talk about being well-rounded don't be afraid i think you said the yoga with the you know sergeant major's wives on base don't be afraid of that because there's so much benefit from using mm -hmm. those muscles and the balance that you get and the stretching that you get, uh, you know, making sure that your hip flexors are going to last and you're not going to have hip replacement when you're, yeah. you know, 45. Yeah. Dude. Well, and, and I'm going to tell you, I, so I have, uh, I've got arthritis in both hips. Mm -hmm. My right hip is a complete disaster. I'm probably going to have it replaced at some point in the next five years. And it's because it's my dominant side. That's the knee that I always took. That's mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, that's, that's my power foot that was always behind me. That was a foot that I always pushed off with. Um, it's, it, it was, it's my power knee when I do Muay Thai. So, uh, it's got a lot more, it's ended up with more miles than my left hip did. So it's, it's going to go first yeah. and it's, it's a daily thing. I mean, I literally feel it every day when I, when I'm doing stuff, but it's manageable. You know, and, and I am trying to work on my, my flexibility because right now my flexibility in my, my hips is just absolutely horrendously bad. Right, and, it, right. and I really, really notice it. I've been, um, John Danaher is here in Austin now, and I've been trying to do Danaher classes uh, at least two times a week. And uh, he's a big, big fan of obviously doing a lot with the legs and, and, uh, and loves the triangle as kind of a, a primary attack point because it's a gateway to so many other things. There's arm bars off of it and everything else. So, and it's, it's challenging me quite a bit because, because of the issues that I have with my hip mobility and hip strength. Right. So, um, man, if, if you're having hip issues now, if you, if you're pre 40 years old and you're having hip issues, then you need to start talking, you need to start talking to a physio. You need to, and definitely probably start doing some yoga and stuff mm -hmm. like that to, to tune yourself up. Because if, if you're having problems that early, by the time you're my age, you're probably going to be on a dual replacement.
Yeah. Which is nothing that you want to do. No. It's not a surgery <laughs> you want to do. Uh, yeah. I just, I don't want to take the time off. You I, know, I, I, I listen, yeah, I, th yeah. that's a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's a big part of it. You know, you're shut down for a, quite in the number of months. So it's mm -hmm. not something you really want to, you know, if you're an active person, that is that for your mental well being is going to be tough. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, we, we, we talk about, you know, nutrition and we talk about exercise and all of these different things. And when you look at the things that men deal with later in life, those two things can help prevent most of the disasters that, yeah. that we're walking into. Uh, heart disease, number one killer of men, basically. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it's the number one killer of women too. So, uh, but we, men get it at a, I think like a seven or 8% uh, higher I haven't looked at the, I, recent, yeah. I haven't looked at the stats recently. Yeah. yeah. So we, you know, and we used to, there was a debate, uh, back in 2011, I think it was, there was a debate about, you know, we call female presentations, uh, of, of myocardial infarction of, of heart attack. We call it an atyp tip. We call most of them, what we call an atypical mm -hmm. presentation yes. because, because they don't, the, the typical man presentation is crushing substernal chest pain, mm -hmm. and difficulty breathing. Whereas as women tend to tend to have slightly different symptoms, it might manifest as shoulder pain or nausea, um, belching. Uh, we call that the atypical. And there was a there was a push to stop calling that atypical because and the reason was, and it makes total sense, is women are the majority of the population. Therefore, why do we allow men to dictate? what the mm -hmm. typical presentation of this disease is yes. and it makes perfect sense. But when you, but when you do look at the numbers, you know, like if, if you look at uh, a typical, um, a typical cardiology department in a typical hospital in the United States and the number of caths that they do in a year, you're going to see that males are more represented. Yeah. Okay. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's, it's an issue that affects all of us because we're mm -hmm. all eating the same crappy diet yep. and we're, and all of us are not exercising like we should, um, men tend to do a little bit more of the stupid stuff, you know, and, and, uh, it, it just, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's the other thing that men, we, we dwarf women in deaths, what I think they call them um, <laughs> accidental, or they use some nice yeah. fun term to make you feel death, better death about being by dumb. Mi death by misadventure. Yeah, something of that nature. You yeah, know what I, mean? I just I call I call it the hey y'all watch this death. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hold my That's beer. Hold my beer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and it's true. I mean, we we especially veterans and military men, especially when you get out, you might be a little bit of a thrill seeker. You might be mm -hmm. looking still for that same adrenaline rush for some of the things that you did in the military and you go out and you do dumb shit. And a mm -hmm. lot of times alcohol is involved. And let's be honest, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, not taking care of yourself leads to all these other problems. You have the diabetes, you have uh, cholesterol, high cholesterol, you have lung issues from smoking for, you know, 30 years while you were in the service. And then you get out and you're like, I'm good to go. Plus you burn pits and all that, and you know, mm -hmm. jet fuel that you were huffing and, uh, you know, anything else that you might have, your, your, your exposures that you had when you were in the military also uh, increase cancers for military members. Uh, again, lung issues, COPD um, for, for military members is through the roof um all your weird cancers uh mm -hmm. you know stuff that normal uh average americans you don't see it as often veterans we see it in a higher rate um mm -hmm. all of the things that you're talking about taking care of yourself help prevent those things where they might not stop it from happening it's going to give you a better chance <laughs> yeah yeah 100 you know. and for all those guys out there worried about their performance and worried about, you know, sexual activity and being able to go in the gym and do their PR and stuff, everything that we're talking about also helps keep your testosterone levels where they belong, your HGH mm -hmm. levels, where they belong. The average male, our testosterone is lower now than it has been in the history of human, you know, uh, uh, evolution. So yeah. you have to do something. Like I went, uh, two years ago and had my testosterone checked. It was lower than it should have been for my age. It wasn't low enough that they recommended testosterone replacement or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They did recommend going on, I think it's Clomid 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's a female fertility drug. But yeah. They said that I could take it once a month and it would help. I decided not to. Um, I wasn't a big fan of that idea. Um, mm -hmm. So I just was like, you know, I'll take better care of myself. I'll exercise more. I'll do that type of stuff. And hopefully that'll help. Um, yeah. But I think testosterone becomes this kind of um, like weird, mystified thing where you hear all these weird theories on testosterone. Where are your thoughts? Yeah. When, so when you go to the doctor. <laughs> Uh, I am on testosterone replacement. Okay. I've been I've been on testosterone replacement since around 2012. Um, I have done a couple episodes of my own podcast talking about it with my good friend Drew Wingy, who mm -hmm. has done who he's been trained in testosterone replacement. And he's written a book, a couple of books on it. Um, I'm actually planning on having him on again probably next month. Cool for for kind of an update and a recap of what we talked about before. But excuse me. Um, there's a, there's a lot to unpack when it comes to testosterone. So I'll, I'll, I'll start macro. So macro, just looking at us as a society, um, some of the pitfalls that we're in here. One of the pitfalls, first of all, as you mentioned, you know, we have lower testosterone levels than probably at any other point in human evolution. And a lot of that has to do with diet and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I would say pretty much all of that has to do with diet and lifestyle, right? Um, now, what does that mean? What, now, does that mean that, uh, you know, evolution is saying we are not slaying saber tooth tigers and mammoths anymore. So we don't need to be as jacked. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay. Um, you know, maybe that is the natural progress of evolution that, uh, you know, 200 years from now will be a, a little bit more diminutive and androgynous, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and we won't look like we look now. I don't know. Well, it'd be longer than, than 200 years. It'd be probably about a thousand years, but you know, yeah, that could be the case. Um, you know, but the, the secondary effect of that is, and this is something that the Joe Rogan talks about all the time is it's not just being big and it's not just lifting a lot and everything else. It's there's a, it, the way you feel it, you know, it affects your mood. Mm -hmm. It affects your sleep. It affects your libido, which means it, it affects pro procreation creation right in the long run affects a lot of things it is it's it's considered normal i'm making air quotes for testosterone to kind of fall off as we get older right mm -hmm. um and this is true in all mammals this isn't just true in people you have less testosterone as you get older so you lose some muscle mass you lose some bone density you, you your libido goes down a little bit um that is you know if you think in a in, a, in term of like a pride of lions yeah, you know, the older lion, his time is gone now. So nature doesn't want him fathering more young with the females. You know, it's, it's somebody else's turn now. That also makes that lion less threatening to the younger males. So, you know, rather than getting killed, he might, he might just get pushed out of the tribe instead of, instead of being killed outright. So there's a lot of reasons for that. But because of the way that we live now, uh, we can get more out of our years. And, and I do believe in taking advantage of the, of all everything that modern medicine can provide. So I don't think it's right to just look at a testosterone level and say, okay, because, because traditionally they go down and on average, that's a, that's a term, right? Mm -hmm. On average, your testosterone is going to go down. Well, that does that mean that that's normal? Not necessarily. So if I say, well, Hey, I'm 55 years old but I want more out of life. I'm not done yet because, you know, I, cause I paid for this for years before I want to enjoy these years now. And I don't want to, I don't want to have shitty libido and shitty sleep and be moody all the time and feel weak and not get gains and winded at the gym. I want to feel good. And I, and I want to be able to do all those things because I earned that. Well, then you should be able to do all that. And it, it's, you know, this whole idea of scaling the testosterone to age, again, this is based on data on what's average. Mm -hmm. It isn't necessarily based on what you could do or you should do or what's optimal for you as an individual. Um, so that's why I think it's important. I, I don't, most doctors who are active in testosterone replacement don't believe in the age adjusted numbers at all. Right. Um, 
also another pitfall that a lot of physicians make who haven't been trained in this is they look at the total number. They don't look at the free testosterone and, and the both are equally important. Yeah. Um, what's also important is what's called the Adams score, which you can, uh, your listeners can go online, you know, Adam, just like Adam and Eve look up Adam score. And, it, and it's a, a clinical questionnaire that if you are, if you have a high score on the Adam score, then clinically, that means you should have your testosterone checked because you're checking all the boxes for having low testosterone. Um, the primary way you always want to attack it, obviously, if you're younger, healthy diet, plenty of sleep, probably the single most important and most neglected thing that you can do to up your testosterone. Because when you're not sleeping, your cortisol goes up, your testosterone goes down because your body is saying, I'm not sleeping. So we must be on the run from a volcanic eruption or a herd migration. And uh, so now is not the time for me to go, man, I feel good. I think I'm going to have sex and, and have a bunch of kids because it, it's not time for that right now. Right. So it, it pushes your testosterone down, right? It's weird how that works, right? Um, so if you're not getting sleep, that's what's going to happen. So getting plenty of sleep, which none of us in the military do, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really, really important. And then eating good, clean, healthy food, plenty of water and working out because we know that the, you know, you're working out. It, it's this great cyclical thing that, you know, the more you work out, the more testosterone you have, the more testosterone you have, the better gains you get, and the more you work out. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on each other. So that's the macro as a society. Now let's look at the micro. Let's look at, at our population veterans. Um, first, my first day in the army, 19 June, 1984. I, the lights flipped on in the holdover barracks, the, uh, the temporary barracks that I was in at Fort Benning, Georgia. The first thought to cross my mind, there's no fucking way I can do this. I, there's no way I can get up this early every morning. This sucks. Yep. This sucks. You know, what the hell did all, I just do? <laughs> what, the, what did I sign up for? I think, yeah. I, you know, like, like Charlie Sheen said, I think I made a big mistake in coming here, Grandma. Yep. It, you know, because it, it's guys are shuffling around all night, bed springs creaking, guys coughing every other damn thing. So I didn't get much sleep to begin with. And now it's 5 a.m. and those lights are on. This sucks, right? That was my life for 32 years. Worse on deployment because I was on a reverse cycle, right? So uh, I had huge swaths of time, you know, all through ranger school, an hour of sleep here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, special forces selection, three hours fighting. You know, all, all this other stuff at the time. So basically I burned out my endocrine system. So it's not surprising that my testosterone, the bottom fell out of my testosterone in my forties, not at all surprising. Now you add to that somebody who maybe has TBI and they have, and, and, and it's compounded, right? Cause they're going to have some pituitary issues on top of that. So there's multiple issues. We don't burn pits might be involved too. We don't know, right. Yeah. We haven't done enough long-term studies on that. I had a friend of mine that said, uh, Low testosterone is the agent orange of our generation. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think the burn pits are the agent orange of our uh, yeah, generation. Yeah, I, I would lean that way myself, yeah. but I understand where he's coming from. Yeah, I do too. I think low T is like the PTSD of our generation. Right. Because we, ha we have, I feel, PTSD is kind of, <clears throat> you know, Vietnam era, you know, uh, uh, you know our fathers and grandfathers, <clears throat> excuse me. PTSD was something men didn't talk about. You yep. know, you, you push that shit down, right? We have finally, thankfully, gotten to a point where we can talk about that. But now we don't, but we don't want to talk about the low T or we want to belittle that, like, oh, you know, you just want to get on the juice or, you know, whatever it is. No, they have this, this is idea a, of the steroid monkey from the 80s. It's kind of yes. something out of a movie of the guy who's going right. to shrink the testicles and, yeah. you know, or, all this other stuff. Again, the myths. Yeah. You know, or somebody like Vitor Belfort who got on it probably like in his twenties. Right. Right. Who had a, who had an exemption air quotes, you know, so that he could get jacked. Um, but the fact of the matter is it, it, in the, we, we do tons of things in our military lifestyle that contribute to endocrine burnout and contri contribute to low T. And then you are the other side of that coin is we are the type of males who don't want to have low T because yeah. we are the type of males who want to keep after it. You know, if we were all wall street types, you know, let's say that working on wall street, uh, or, you know, selling insurance, may maybe that lifestyle was prone to having low T those guys would probably adapt to it better. 
because you know they don't want to run obstacle courses, jump out of airplanes, um, you know, go go tearing down a river in a motorized boat, you know, spraying fifty cal into the into the jungle on the side. Uh, these are all things that we want to keep doing. So we're going to be less tolerant of that because we're you know this term gets uh, people boohoo on the term alpha male, but a lot of us really are. Um, yeah, you talk about alpha male, you talk about warrior, that term, yeah, you yeah. know, uh, a lot in the book. And it, it is, I mean, you want, like you just said those things. I was like, oh, that sounds like fun. Are we going to do that? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, yeah, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be like, no, nah, I don't want to do that shit. Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. But I'm guessing a lot of your listeners would, you know, they, yeah. they want to continue to do those things. They want to ch you know, chase that adrenaline high yeah. and do these other things. And can you do that with low T? Wow. It makes it really challenging, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, Cause I, you know, I know what it was like when my tea was low before and I got on it and I felt better. And then there was a time period where I stopped it completely. I stopped it cold Turkey. Um, and that was the most miserable I've ever been in my entire life. Um, when I got back on it, I had a friend of mine say it, your listeners probably know Tim Kennedy was, mm -hmm. was the friend we were having lunch and he goes, man, you look so much better. He goes, you literally looked like you didn't have a soul. And, and that's the way I felt when I, when I wasn't on it. Cause at this point it's my body's not making any, you know, cause, and, and again, that, and that's the risk, right. Is that my body was making some, and then I, I began getting it exogenously, right. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm replacing it, you know, by, by giving myself a shot every week. So now my body's not making any, you know, so am I pretty much dependent on that? Yeah, pretty much am. You know, and, and yeah, that kind of sucks. You know, I, and I talk about this, I talked about it on a podcast. I talked about it in, a, in Instagram live yesterday that it kind of sucks being, you know, dependent on blood pressure, medicine, insulin. Hey, you can put TRT, you know, I'm not, I'm not a hypocrite. You can put TRT in that, in that mm -hmm. same category. Um, so yeah, zombie apocalypse happens. I'm, I'm probably looting pharmacies. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll cross that bridge when it, when it comes. But, but see, um, here's the thing. Like you said, you compare it to other drugs. We're, we're, we're as a society, we're dependent on the drugs that we take. We, yeah. there's no, so there's no problem with being on cholesterol medication for the rest mm -hmm. of somebody's life. That's perfectly acceptable, socially acceptable, mm -hmm. but having to be on testosterone that's not okay because you're not making your own anymore. Right. Well, right. But you, you, you're the same person as taking 80 milligrams of uh, a statin, you know? Yeah. Uh, it, or a blood pressure medication. Or whatever. Or, it could be yeah, anything. Whatever. Right. Yeah. We're all on some, I mean, I have heart disease. I, I talk about it on the show. I, I had three heart attacks in 2020. Um, you know, uh, to, they still don't know why I'm going to cardiologists. Wow. Uh, I didn't have high cholesterol. I didn't have family history. Didn't have any kind of any of the markers that would have, it just, it happened. You know, it, wow. it, some, these things happen. Yeah. Um, so I'm on, I take three medicines every single day and I probably will for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm 41 right now. Yeah. Well, why is it okay for me to do that? But you're trying to better yourself and, and be the best that you can be just like, I'm trying to be the best I can be. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with doing what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. It shouldn't be looked that way. Yeah. And I don't think there is, you know, it's, yeah. you know, for the lifestyle that I want to continue to lead and I want to continue exactly. to be active. Uh, and I, I want to, want to continue to contribute to the tribe. Um, you know, this, this, this is what it is, but yeah. you know, it's, uh, I think over time, you know, again, you know, you know, equating, equating low T to the, uh, is the PTSD of our military generation. I think we need to, uh, you know, divorce ourselves from the stigma. Mm -hmm. And the military is not initially, at least initially, was not helpful in this because this, this was something that, you know, like like most things, it was identified first in the in the special operations community, right? That uh, hey, these guys are feeling like shit. They're going to outside doctors. They're finding out that their T is low. Well, then the reactionary thing from that command was, all right. This is a bunch of jacked operators that want to continue to be jacked op operators, right? They, they just, want to get a want, prescription for steroids. Is basically yeah, what they're, they're trying yeah, to they do. Want, yeah, they want an edge, yeah. right? They're, they're, this is yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so their answer was, okay, this is what we're going to do. Everybody who's on it, stop taking it, and uh, you're going to stop taking it, and we're going to, and then in six months we're going to see where your levels are, and then we're going to come up with a military program to address that. And my question was, are you going to make all those guys non-deployable for six months? Because I guarantee you, none of them are going to want to deploy. 
Are you going to tell them all they don't have to take a PT test for six months? You know, are you going to give them all psychological counseling from the crash of going to zero T, not low T, zero T? Are you going to give them marital counseling? I was because just going to say, yeah. You have to explain to their wife, this is why your husband doesn't want to have sex with you mm -hmm. for six months, right? Uh, so it was a little bit more nuanced than that. And, yeah. and I'm hoping that over time, they'll come around and, you know, I was still on active duty when I was on replacement and, and I was, uh, my command was fully aware of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't try to hide it from anybody. Um, I did initially try to do it through, I was going to see if the military would, I, I, I had my Adam score. I had my levels. I had all of that reviewed by a physician trained in testosterone replacement who told me, yep, you need to be on it. I can put you on it right now. And I said, oh, hold on, pump the brakes. I'm going to try to do this the right way. I went to, uh, I guess, I guess I wasn't completely accurate when I said I'd never seen my PCM before, um, because I did see my PCM uh, a couple years before that for specifically for this reason. And my PCM at that time was a family medicine resident. He didn't know how to interpret the lab results. Mm -hmm. So he called not an endocrinologist. He called a urologist who didn't really, you know, that was a urologist who knew how to do bladder surgery and, and all this other stuff didn't really know how to how to do uh testosterone replacement so he's like all right and, and and they both said the same thing well for your age your total testosterone is fine yep they didn't even they didn't even address my free testosterone they only addressed my total and they addressed it for my age and i'm like i gotta you, you know this i feel like shit. my exercise tolerance is in the toilet i'm not sleeping i have zero libido like all this other shit, you know, I got a deployment coming up in six months. And on that deployment, I'm expected to keep up with tier one operators. And you're just, you're throwing me to the dogs here. And I was very honest with them. I go, look, I'm not doctor shopping, but I'll tell you this. It's, you guys are both telling me the same story, which is you're not trained to address this. I'm going to go to an outside physician and I'm going to, I'm going to get I'm going to have TRICARE pay for my prescription. I'm not hiding this from anybody. There's going to be a computer wreck. What, and uh, what, if anybody's on active duty, what you may not realize is anytime you go to a pharmacy and get a drug, whether a military provider wrote that for you or not, if they know you're on active duty military, and you're on TRICARE, there's a record of that in the military database. Mm -hmm. So this is the way I used to have, you know, uh, all the time people on pain contracts getting opiates off post they go to they go to an off post emergency room on a Sunday night and they get a prescription for you know percocet or whatever oxycontin that shows up in my computer right so all of my prescriptions are, are part of my computer records so in, and i was very i was vocal about it i said i'm not trying yes i'm going to a civilian doctor yep. but it's not because i'm doctor shopping it's because you guys don't seem to uh, to know how to address this and I'm not hiding shit. I'm not going to pay for it. I'm not paying for it out of pocket, even though I could. It's all good. There's going to be a computer record on all of this. So if you want to call me before the man and have me stand at attention and answer for this, I'm more than happy to do it. But almost immediately, my quality of life improved. My PT improved. My jujitsu improved. I felt better. My, my libido was better. Um, and it was the right, it was 100% the right thing to do. And I've been on it ever since. I, I'm glad you're kind of talking about this. And I know, listen, I, I encourage people to go and listen to the previous podcasts uh, that you did uh, uh, on your website and, and, you know, through iTunes and all Spotify and everything, because for anybody out there that is thinking about testosterone replacement, or if you are feeling down, uh, if you're, if you are not feeling like what you remember yourself to be, mm -hmm you want to make sure you're going to the right doctors because yeah. too many people yes. are going to steer you in the wrong direction. Yeah. And I'm not saying I know which one is right and which one is wrong. Cause I really don't, but yeah. the information is out there to better prepare you to be an advocate. Like you mm -hmm. were this, something doesn't sound right. Going yeah. to a urologist and not an uh, endocrinologist, probably there's a red flag right there. They're not, yeah. you know, everybody has their specialty. And even yeah. within those specialties, there's going to be people that are trained on modern, TRT, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, and then there's going to be people with very old thoughts and very old habits and say, no, your free testosterone is, uh, is, is not important. It's your total testosterone and it's adjusted mm -hmm. for your age and you're good to go. Yeah. And, and you're, you're going to see, you're going to see physicians, clinicians on both sides of the coin. Some, yep. 
some are like, yeah, you know, they're eye rolling. You're just another guy who wants to get jacked. I'm not going to give it to you. Right. Yeah. And then other guys are way too quick to pull the trigger. Right. Right. You know, I, I've, I had a, a retired SF guy tell me he went to his doctor and he said, Hey, I think I need my testosterone checked. And the, and the guy said to him, well, why do we, why, why bother to check it? You want to get jacked? I'll write you for it right now. And I'm like, I would run from that doctor. Yeah. That's not, that's not that's, somebody that has your health. Yeah. In, yeah. In, because in mind. there have been cases where guys have gotten on TRT and, and testosterone was never their issue. You mm -hmm. know, it's, uh, I'm having exercise doc. I'm having exercise intolerance. I don't, I don't feel my cardio is not good. My lifting is not good. Uh, all these other issues, you know, I just, I feel off. Well, it sounds like your testosterone. Let's get you on some testosterone. It wasn't, he had a tumor. Yeah. Okay. It's testosterone is not going to fix a tumor. So then he went another six months without getting his tumor diagnosed. Did the testosterone increase his tumor growth? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you can have other issues. You can have thyroid issues. You know, you need to have an entire panel. So you need to sit down with that doctor and say, look, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be an ass, but what are your quali what are your qualifications? What's your specific training? on testosterone testosterone replacement you know that's you know they say well i did you know i did a residency in x and that's it you know whether that's family medicine whether that's internal medicine they're they're probably not equipped to address that okay yeah. now if they said you know hey i did i did course x you know and, and a lot of these it's not a full-blown we call it a fellowship but it's not a full-blown fellowship it's only usually like a one or two week course where they, where they have to pass a battery of written tests at the end to get what you get a certification, but they should be able to show you. And the, but these are very comprehensive. Yeah. These are very comprehensive. And it also plugs them into a network where whenever they have a question, they can reach back out to that organization that gave them the training and they can help them with that. And, and some of it is what we call cookbook medicine, right? You know, mm -hmm. the guy comes in, you know, you ask him these questions, you, you test X, Y, and Z, if this is positive, this goes to this, and then that goes to that. And then your next step is this, you know, it's very, very algorithmic and that's fine. Um, as long as they're walking you through that algorithm properly. But, you know, I I've seen physicians that are cavalier about it. Um, some are, you know, it's, you have dismissive on one end of the spectrum and cavalier on the other end of the spectrum. And that's not what you want. You want, you want somebody who's very sober and sane and logical about it. And is going to check your labs and, and continue to per periodically check those labs, you know, there because it's TRT is not without risk. Of course. Um, what's that? You, you cut you cut out on me there. Sorry. Was that oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you you it, the whole thing just paused for a second. We'll have to cut yeah. that out. Uh, you okay. were saying it's not without risk. Yeah, TRT is not without risks. You know, it's um. So my uh, I was kind of on the upper end, my, my, my blood, I've never had a problem with anemia. My blood is kind of the other way up. My blood tends to run a little bit on the thick side. And then when I started taking TRT, that became a little bit worse, not dangerously. So, but there are people that it becomes, you know, really hyper viscous, you know, basically mm. now and think about your, your heart is now pushing, you know, mud, you know, instead of, instead of beating water, it's trying to beat mud and imagine, you know, the, the difficult work, think about how that increases your risk for things like stroke. Yeah. Uh, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, it's, uh, these are things you have to keep an eye on. You know, we call it polycythemia, which, you know, you have your, your cells, your cell count in your blood is, is on the high side. So I'm borderline polycythemic. That's something that I have to keep an eye on because if my blood becomes too thick, then all of a sudden I am at risk for having, you know, I'll, I'll be, you know, I was doing a trap bar deadlift this morning. I'll be in the middle of a trap bar deadlift and, and I'll stroke out. And then yeah. you know, that's, that's not ideal. You don't no. want that. <laughs> no, not when you're trying to uh, enhance your life. You don't want to bring right. your life to a crashing halt. Uh, yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah. So, and then you talk about, you know, testosterone and stuff like that, but people don't have to jump that far into uh, just improving their lifestyle, improving their nutrition, exercise. There's also supplements that you yeah. can be taking to, uh, you know, kind of better your overall health. And you have, two, I believe on your website for uh, Graybeard. Um, so tell me a little bit about your supplements, where the people can find it and, and why you decided to do that. Yeah. My supplements are available at uh, graybeardperformance.com. As you mentioned, I have two in my supplement line now. Um, my, my 
my long-term plan is to have probably seven. Okay. Um, uh, what that was spawned out of was, um, you know, years ago, uh, you know, I, I became a doctor at age 40. So, uh, you know, I was, I, I was going into my intern year at a time when most people are in middle management and they're kind of downshifting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was working 24 hour shifts and, and swing shifts and everything else and, um, eating on the fly, doing everything that's bad for your health. Yes. So I started taking a, you know, for a while I, I tried to just wing it and I gained a bunch of weight and felt like shit. And then I said, okay, I got, I got to get a handle on, on what I'm doing on my diet and everything else. And that's when I really started to do a deep dive into supplementation. And, uh, I discovered, you know, there, there are certain things, especially if you're looking at high level performance and high level longevity that, you know, that you need to supplement almost everybody in the Western world is vitamin D deficient. Yep. Now to give an example, most of us aren't getting enough zinc, aren't getting enough magnesium. Um, uh, this is particularly important if you look, you know, like say, you know, COVID vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, yep. these are all things that you need for your immune system, immune boosting and for tissue repair. So, and, uh, the longevity formula, which was the first formulation that, that I came out with for Graybeard is all about that. It's all about, it's, it's anti-inflammatories in the form of turmeric, it's vitamins, it's trace minerals, uh, it's bioparin, it's everything that you need that, you know, right now sitting in this chair talking to you, you know, I did some pretty robust strength and conditioning training this morning. My body has the substrate to repair itself to mm -hmm. include vitamins and trace minerals because I'm taking my longevity formula supplement. And uh, also, I, you know, again, the turmeric, the anti-inflammatory, so I don't feel sore. I feel right. good. I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to jujitsu tonight. I'm doing all uh, pretty much all this week. I think when, I think tomorrow is the only day I'm not doing two workouts a day. So, and I can do that because, uh, I'm, I'm eating right. I'm getting plenty of water. I'm getting plenty of sleep and I'm doing the supplements that I need for my body to repair itself in between. Yeah. Um, the second most, you know, so the first most common complaint that I get in guys over the age of 40 is just that, that, yeah, I can go work out, but Oh my God, it takes me so much longer to recover. And that's, that's, that was the inspiration for me coming up with longevity formula. And I had kind of pieced it together on my own throughout the years and, and figured out that this is what I need for tissue repair. So, uh, I was taking it in the form of like six different pills. And I'm like, why can't I just get this in one pill? Why don't I just put this in one pill? So I decided to just do it myself. The second most common thing that I get is, well, I have the energy to do it. Try taking, you know, I tried pre-workouts or whatever. I feel like my head's going to explode. And then, uh, and if I'm doing an evening workout, then I can't sleep when I get out. So then right. on top of else, so the else I, I got to take an Ambien to sleep mm -hmm. to counteract it. So I came up with energy formula, which is, you know, I wanted something that was going to be clean without jittery side effects. It was going to have a clean source of caffeine in the form of uh, yerba mate, it was going to have some good essential B vitamins and some amino acids, things that you need for an energy boost without side effects. And that wouldn't keep you jacked, you know, going a hundred, you know, like you're on crack right. for six hours. So, uh, I don't, I typically don't, you know, I drink, I drink a cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, and I'm, I'm currently having two a day, which I often tell people not to do, but I'm doing that. Um, but I'll take two energy formula 30 minutes before I go to jujitsu tonight. I feel energetic. I feel focused. I feel good. Um, I feel great throughout that two hour class. I come home, I have a light meal. And by the time I'm winding down at nine o'clock, it's completely out of my system. And, uh, it's not giving me any difficulties with going to sleep. So that's my, my energy formula. Next one uh, to come, uh, is going to be my vitality formula, which I talk about, uh, in the book, mm -hmm. which, uh, is going to be, uh, some memory stuff, uh, some, uh, oxygenation optimization stuff, um, and some, uh, some, some good vascular stuff. Basically it's, there's going to be a form of a natural Viagra in there as well. And that's going to be in my vitality, vitality formula, which people are like really clamoring for you. Sorry, guys, I got, it, it takes capital investment for me to get these pallets of supplements made yeah. <laughs> that, that doesn't grow on trees. I'm getting, I'm getting this done as quickly as I can. So, uh, but again, eventually I'm going to have seven SKUs, uh, a line of at least seven supplements could be more than that. Cause I I'm, 
I'm learning new things all the time about supplementation and about uh, about clinical trials and stuff. And in all of my supplements, I only put ingredients in. You know, the, when I first came out, the biggest uh, feedback that I got was, "There's not very, you know, this other supplement that's your competitor. It's got 15 things in it. Yours only has six. And yeah. I'm like, yeah. Nine of their thing, nine of the things that they got in there don't do shit. <laughs> There's no data. It's just right? filler, basically. It's just fill. It's just completely just filler, right? It's just it's colored urine. That's you're yeah. paying for colored urine. And I'm I am all about only putting in stuff that has solid clinical data behind it. And uh, also, I don't believe in a lot of these companies will put in five thousand times the RDA to fill yes. that capsule. And I won't do that. Because especially when it comes to certain, like if you look at the fat soluble vitamins, which are a prime example, A, D, E, and K, you can overdose on you those. You can vitamins. overdose, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to be responsible for that. I'm not yeah. putting 5,000 times the RDA of vitamin D or vitamin E in there. You're not going to the ER with vitamin D toxicity because of something that I put out there. I am yeah. not comfortable with that happening. Yeah. So, you know, I have a conscious. I'm, I'm not. I'm not big pharma. I'm not some big company. Uh, I'm one guy who wanted to do good for, for other guys. So, uh, so I'm not going to walk around with, you know, every day worrying that somebody's going to OD on a product that I put out there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's great stuff. And, and I, it's important that people understand just walking into a 7-Eleven and picking up some weird supplement that you get on the shelf, <laughs> people are like, oh, well, it's all natural. It can't hurt me. <laughs> be careful. Yeah. Be careful. Everything yeah. you put in your body has yeah. a reaction, yeah. whether it's good or bad <laughs> or indifferent. Guess what? Guess what else is all natural? Nightshade, which will kill you. Yeah. Foxglove, which will kill you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like all, all these other things, all natural, but they'll kill you. <laughs> a lot, a lot, of, lot of natural stuff is pretty yeah. nasty. So there's yeah. a lot of, there's some all natural arsenic out there you can get your hands. <laughs> yes, yeah, for sure. And that's the thing. Like people, you have to be careful and you want to understand what you're putting into your body. You know, we had Hunter seven on and we were talking about understanding your exposures, big thing, mm -hmm. big push this year for them was understanding your exposures. The other flip side of that is understanding what you personally put in your body, mm -hmm. uh, because that is just another form of exposure. You're exposing your body to whatever you're ingesting. So understand what that stuff does to you, whether it is supplements, whether it is TR2, uh, TRT, um, you know, whether it's alcohol, cigarettes, all of these different things, everything has an impact on your, your inner workings. <laughs> yeah. hundred so, percent. Um, Mike, it's been a blast talking to you, man. I've kept you for hell just about an hour and a half and we've, we've hit a lot of topics, but I want to make sure that, uh, people know where they can get the book, um, more information about you and what you're doing. Um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, websites, all that kind of stuff, please. Yeah. Uh, so my book, uh, you go to Amazon, it's available on Amazon, uh, Goodreads, barnesandnoble.com, walmart.com. Uh, the title of the book is honed. H O N E D finding your edge as a man over 40. Just type that into the search bar and it'll pop up. Um, you can go to uh, my primary business website, which is graybeardperformance.com. There's a link to my book there. You can also get my supplements there. I have rash guards, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu geese there as well. Also apparel. I've got some cool old man strength t-shirts and hats and, and stuff like that there. I do have an older website, drmikesimpson.com, which has a link to my book and also links to the Graybeard website. But it's really just to say, if you want to just basically read my bio and, and mm. stuff like that, that was my initial branding site. I'm on Instagram, Dr. Mike Simpson, D-R-M-I-K-E-S-I-M-P-S-O-N. Uh, Graybeard Performance also has its own Instagram account and its own Facebook account. Very good. Well, again, it's been a pleasure to talking to you. There's been a lot of information here. It's a lot for everybody to kind of unfold. I really encourage people to go and listen to your podcast. Uh, the guests that you've had on are excellent. And, you know, a lot of information there. Uh, and again, highly recommend getting the book and being the best man over 40 that we can possibly be. And if you aren't a man over 40, still get the book. You're going to you will be. that time. You will be over <laughs> yeah. 40 one day. Get the book yeah. now. Don't do what we all did and waited until yeah. afterwards and now trying to repair time. I, I um, wish I had this information at 26. You know, 
And I wish I was smart enough to kind of start researching back then, knowing what I know now. But I, I guess that's the oldest. Uh, yeah. In the book, you know. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> but Mike, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, sir. You too. All right.